welcome back to the Shirtless Plantain Show, the Arsenal edition. This is your host, Dean, and today I am here with Mitch. What's going on, Mitch? I uh, woke up nice and early this morning, saw so I score some goals. I can't, I can't complain. I can't complain. You cannot complain. Coach, you were at the game. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I, I wore shorts to a game for the first time since, oh, wow. September? September? What is it? Yeah. I, think, I think I may have been there for the last time you wore shorts. It's a weird fucking thing to remember. <laughs> I don't think I don't, I'm not sure if it was that game. But I just remember it was around that period. Like, oh. yeah, it's it's that's how you know summer's here. Basically, when you when you're wearing shorts to Arsenal games, you know summer's here. Yeah, global warming. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>. um, <laughs> let's get to the game, guys. Uh, we just beat Bournemouth three zero. We keep the pressure on in the title race. We're four points ahead of Man City, but at the time of recording. I believe they're three zero up on Wolves at halftime. Um, we should not be talking about that because it's mad depressing. But you know, keep up alive, guys. Keep up alive. Um, to the lineups uh, during the part for the Chelsea game, I put it to the crew that Arteta had just selected his preferred lineup for the rest of the season. Meaning that you know, we all kind of, at this point we all know who the the mainstays are. I'm not going to get into mm-hmm. them, but Tommy Asu at left back, a position of controversy. Uh, Trossard at left wing, you know, which is often Martinelli instead, but won't mm-hmm. be for the rest of the year probably. And number five as our defensive midfielder. Uh, Bournemouth are a team that they've been in top five form for basically all of 2024. Yeah. Obviously, they're not mm-hmm. fifth in the table or anything like that. But I believe for the if you limit the table to January till now, they're either fifth or fourth. Uh, they've been very mm-hmm. good. Very good uh, counter-pressing team. Very good counter-attacking team. Shalane K, everything is built around him. He's the outlet. They play through him. They hurt teams when they sit deep. So given the fact that this is the title running, we have to win every game. We have to get three points in every game to try to keep up with the fucking cheating machine. <laughs> <laughs> this was not a trap game. Um, mm. However, given the fact that we got three points today and we got in three points in each of our last, I believe, three games, uh, starting with the Chelsea mm. game, when this lineup began, Mitch, would you say that you now trust this lineup and we can expect to see this for the remaining two games of the season? Yeah, I mean, we've won three straight with it. I don't think we're going to be making any changes. Uh, if there's anything that I think Arteta has not learned from Pep is that he's not really as much of a tinkerer as Pep is, mm-hmm. where if we go on a run of good form with a lineup, as long as everyone in that lineup remains healthy, for the most part, it's going to stay the same. Um, unless we have like a game in there like against a relegation candidate where we're able to maybe have a different personnel, um, we're probably going to be running with the same lineup. And I think that it's pretty likely that we have the same lineup against Manchester United and Everton. I'm glad you mentioned Manchester United because uh, coach that, you know, we, we both share a lot of trauma. That's why we're on this <laughs> podcast together. Old Trafford is the theater of nightmares for us. Um, mm-hmm. I know they're in shit form. I know they've had a bad season, but the thing about them is that they play these crazy front to back games. You know, like yeah. we do the control theme wrong. Is there an argument that number five should maybe sit for Jorginho or more controlling midfielder? Or do we just go with the, we're playing well, this is a team, fuck it? it I think it, it depends, really. But, we you know, just looking at United's, I suppose, um, current problems, you know, Casemiro is playing in defence and probably will play in defence against us. McTominay, I think, is out for the rest of the season. Um, they haven't got any real space invaders or athletes in midfield, so I'm I'm comfortable um, tactically playing playing number five there. Um, I think his height is quite important as well. But I will say, um, Jorginho's positioning I, I think is slightly better than than number five's. But again, it, I feel like it's just we're split we're splitting hairs here. But if I had to pick, I'd I'd probably just stick with five just because. Okay, fair enough. Um, Mitch, I've seen some criticism, mainly from rival fans, about the fact that we have had a consistent lineup for a lot of this year, meaning that we haven't had a lot of injuries. My thinking is that that's probably a result of the fact that we don't play crazy shit like annual ball, where our center backs have to sprint fucking 40 yards every five minutes to, to, to stop a counterattack. Um, is it more luck or that? What do you think? If you're splitting percentage? Um, I, I, I don't think, like, I, th- I really think we need to stop giving any uh, ounce of care about what rival fans have to say about literally anything, because yeah. there's nothing that will ever, like, like we'll, we'll 
if we win the title this year, there's going to be rival fans that are like, uh, oh, the Premier League was actually like weak this season. So like, don't even give a shit about like whatever they say uh, at any point in time about anything. And yeah, probably some of that's luck. And uh, it's great to have some good luck because last season we didn't have good luck with injuries. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is probably a little bit of how we play. We're a little bit more um, thoughtful with how, how we press and how we uh, use our energy and use our legs, which has allowed us to be in really good form here at the end of the season and not imploding uh, like, like we've seen from Liverpool or like we saw from us last year. You could just start at Liverpool, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them. Um, <laughs> coach, <laughs> coach uh, you were at the game, and uh, mm. uh, the the first thing I thought that that first thirty minutes it, it brought one of your favorite phrases to mind: siege ball. Mm. The manager yeah. in the interview after the game uh, responded to a journalist by saying that he believes the half we played was probably our best half of the season. Um, mm. Do you agree with that assessment? I don't. I don't. It's one of the. It, it, it's it's it, it's it's a good performance, and it's one of. I suppose it's one of the one of the ones we can file away and say, do you know what? We should have scored more. Um, there's a, there's quite a few first halves from this season. That I think, wow, we we look like shit up today. But today was just one of those ones where it's like, had we scored all those chances, it would be remembered more fondly. But I don't. I've seen complete performances in the first half from Arsenal this season, and this doesn't rank there for me only because of. Um, some of the stuff we did off the ball, um, I wasn't really comfortable. Uh, and also the manner of which we missed some of those chances, we we didn't, it didn't even look, the rash chance is, is always going to stick in my head because it just, he had so much time, he, he set himself and somehow he still managed to snatch at it. And I think as a professional football, snatching at chances, I, f I feel like it's almost like a cardinal sin, like you shouldn't be doing that, you're a professional, but then I forget. Professional is also human, okay. <laughs> you know? So, uh, the, 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 yeah. So, but um, but yeah, I think overall that first half, um, good, good first half. But then that shaky moment from Gabriel, um, with Saliba cleaning up, that doesn't really happen. Like it's it's very rare that that, that happens. So yeah. Well said, coach. Um, a lot happened. Mainly us missing mm -hmm. chances, snatching at chances, mm -hmm. like coach hates, which a problem with snatches, buddy. Um. However, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's the spirit of uh, spirit of Tosin floating around this bitch. Uh, however, the first really memorable moment from the game, Mitch, happened to be Ryan Christie's awful tackle on Kyle Saka. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, throughout the last four games now, we've had an opportunity to play against 10 men. And uh, PGMOL and Howard Webb have just decided that, nah, we're amputating motherfuckers now. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of this? Uh, well, I mean, everyone knows the rules. Within the first 15 minutes of a game, you're allowed to do whatever you want, bar killing someone. Um, so, you know, it, if you're Nicholas Jackson going studs up, uh, was it Bed and White in that game um, that he went studs up on? Tomiyasu. It was Tomiyasu. Um, or uh, Christy Today on Saka. It's it's more than well. It's it's encouraged actually within the first fifteen minutes. It's an, it's an amnesty period. Everyone's getting their feet wet in the game. You know we're we're waking up. We're easing into it. We're throwing studs into people's shins and making them bleed. It's part of the game. Like let's yeah. stop being babies. You're allowed to do it in the first team fifteen minutes. All right. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Stop being fucking babies, Arsenal fans. You know, we're amputating people here. It's okay. Um, that's, uh, if it was in the 16th minute, I would be, my head would be on Mars. They should be, he should be off. But in the 15th, it's completely okay. It's just that that's the borderline right there, right? Yeah. Exactly. No, I, I like a man that knows his boundaries. Um, coach, you happen to be in the stadium, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in shorts. Just still fucking weird because you're 82 <laughs> years old. Um, <laughs> but um, Man, today, to uh, amen to that. Amen to that. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope we all get old. Um, but uh, today, uh, unfortunately, uh, a young man in London did not have the chance to get old. Um, he hmm. got uh, apparently assaulted by someone with a sword. Yeah. And passed. And he happens to be a very big uh, Arsenal fan. Uh, his name was Daniel Andrein. And um, hmm. The club made the nice gesture of acknowledging the fact that this uh, young man had passed. You happened to be there when it happened. Can you give us a bit of the flavor of the moment and how that passed in the state? Do you know what? It was because it was around the time I think Saka was just coming back um, from, me, um, from, from his treatment. 
Um, and yeah, literally, it was just ev- everywhere it's got, you know, we've had tributes to the station before, obviously, but this was just, you know, it, everyone, it, it felt as if everybody was waiting for it. And the moment it hit the 40th minute, there was no hesitation, you know, just kept on clapping, kept on clapping, kept on clapping. And I think we clapped maybe a little longer than the minute and we stopped, like, you know, we were making progress down the pitch and I'm pretty sure Ben White was on one or corner, something like that. And that's when we stopped, but we were clapping for, I think, at least beyond the minute. Um, but yeah, tragic, tragic story. And, I, you know, I, I do hope that's gone some way to at least, it's never ever going to replace my bringing back, but at least, you know, it's gone some way to helping at, at least no, people, um, his family, you know, that people are thinking of, of him and their family at this time. Yeah, it's tragedy, tragedy sad. I yeah, mean, his uh, soul rest in peace. Um, Amen. That's the game. Those chances that coach mentioned, Mitch. Um, <laughs> put it this way. There was a five-minute period where Arsenal had 96% possession. <laughs> there were 16 shots in that first half. Like, we could go through a list of each of the shots. Coach already mentioned the Rice one. Um, there was a Tomiyasu header. There was a Saliba run into the box. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's use that one as our jumping off point because that's something we don't see very often. William Saliba with the, with the ball at his feet in the box after he'd made essentially a, a full-field run with the ball. You know, mm-hmm. pass it to Saka, got it back. I guess what I really want to talk about, and we're going to do this for at least two other people, and I'm going to go ahead and spoil it now. One of them is going to be Declan Rice. The other one will be Kai Havertz. But mm-hmm. my first candidate for man of the match was William Saliba. I thought, mm-hmm. not that he's had any like bad performances in the last few weeks, but I thought this was, given the opponent, given what they managed to create on the day, I thought this was one of the, for me, <laughs> arguably man of the match. Um, mm-hmm. Please wax lyrical on William Saliba. What did you like today about what you saw? Uh, you know, it was kind of a rare shaky game from Gabrielle a little bit. Um, and Saliba was able to, you know, th- that's why they complement each other so well. Like if one of them has a little bit of an off game, which by the way, a Gabrielle off game is like still one of the best defenders in the league. Um, mm-hmm. but there was a moment where he kind of gets beat by Solanke, uh, and Saliba just calmly comes over, collects the ball. Like, or, uh, like he's just always in the right place at the right time. He's always got this air of calmness around him. It's the biggest attribute that we've given him since he started starting for Arsenal at the beginning of the last season. Um, and it's he's just a wonderful player to watch. And then also mm-hmm. when you have those opportunities where he's all of a sudden through on goal, it's mm-hmm. like, well, what what are we doing here? This is amazing. <laughs> like, uh, it, it helps when you're camped so far in the opposition's uh, territory that your center back is basically playing on the 18 yard box. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, uh, he's a joy to watch. He's just like, just simply better than everyone on the field. And it's so much fun. Yeah. Uh, better than everyone. He's better than everybody else in the world, man. I've had enough, man. I'm, I'm taking the gloves <laughs> off. I think Saliba, <laughs> for real, like, I, f- I think, I think at this point now, like, it's just, it's just inarguable. There's maybe, maybe, maybe one other guy and he plays for Real Madrid and whatever. I don't care. Like, you're weird. You, you, you bite people and, and try to scare police officers. I don't care. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but Saliba, Saliba, has, Saliba, Saliba has, is developing into a player that I feel he... There isn't much he can't do. Um, I can imagine in training, for example, that when they're having the small-sided games, he might just decide to play up front and just be, and just be fine there. Um, technically... He's, he's really pushing through the team out to be one of our best technical players. And I think that's such a huge positive, huge um, asset to have, should I say, considering the way we play, you know, it's high risk the way we defend, you know, leaving our defenders 1v1 with a lot of, you know, forwards. But then on the ball, the way we attack, it's, you know, the 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 the, the, the duties are split a bit more because Gabriel's passing come on leaps and bounds. But Saliba's a weapon in possession for us, like a genuine weapon. And, that's where I feel like the actual value of him comes from. Not the fact that he's a great defender and he can defend because as he gets older, he's going to be a better defender. But I'm curious to see how far he can go and the things he can do with the football when we, ha- when we have the ball because that's the most interesting thing for me. He's six foot three. He's probably going to, he might grow a bit more. I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope not too. But yeah, you know. Because we can sort of see um, another player on the team sort of dealing with the effects of having a growth spurt after coming to prominence and that person happens to be Kai um he's sort of I mean obviously he's made pretty good work of his last growth sport so far uh but I thought today 
And um, this is a special request from our fellow co-host, Gabby, because uh, she, she feels like she loves Kai Havertz more than the rest of us, which she really mm. doesn't. But, you know, whatever. We'll deal with that when she comes back. But Mitch, yeah. uh, I thought he didn't get a goal. He didn't get an assist. But for me, this was Kai Havertz's best performance as a number nine for Arsenal. Just the link up, everything he did was spectacular. Uh, yeah, all round performance. Um, I, you mentioned his, his height and his growth spurt. And I think that's one thing that I just like absolutely love to see from him as a center forward is how, uh, outstanding of an outlet that he is. We're able to kind of hit these long balls and he's able to head them down. We're able to win a second ball from it. Um, and it's really, really helpful to be able to switch the field and, and get the ball back. Um, I, I just feel like he's getting more and more comfortable every single time he plays, not only as a center forward, but just as an Arsenal player. Um, I feel like there was a lot of like times where he was able to collect a pass and, and find someone one time or uh, take a touch and find someone that we weren't seeing at the beginning of the season. Granted, he was playing in a little bit of a different role, but I think he's he's way more in tune with his teammates now. He's like understanding where he is and where he is playing in the system is better. He's more comfortable taking shots um obviously none went in today but like he uh is kind of developing more of that striker like thought process of like receiving turning shooting Mm -hmm. um which even if when he was playing as a center forward earlier in the season we weren't seeing as much um and it's been a really really fun development to see because I think he's going to go fucking crazy next year. <laughs> like I, I genuinely like, there's so much talk about us buying a center forward and maybe we do. Um, but I think there's a genuine chance that Kai is just our main center forward next year and that he scores 20 goals. Like I, I I'm dead serious when I think that that is a real possibility for next season. Hmm. That's not unreasonable. Um, uh, look, I'll be, I'll be honest. I, this is this version of Kai Havertz didn't see a hint of this at Leverkusen. This level of intelligence, this level of of mature number nine play wasn't evident. He was very much someone that was a great space invader, but was really handy on the ball as well. He looked very confident, you know, to create chance for other people. And now he's become that sort of player that can run onto balls all day long and win penalties that potentially he might not deserve <laughs> let's just say it like that but he it's a constant thing he keeps on doing it and we we all know about you know if you keep putting yourself in certain positions what the likely outcome is going to be um i'll be honest i haven't seen a proper replay of this so i can't comment too much on on um on how on how much you know you know he he sold it but i will say odegaard popping up in that position Again, for that, and then Odo, and then Havertz making that run, it's a weapon for us. It's just, it's clear, it's a weapon. It, Odegaard doesn't have to think too much. Havertz can just run into the space knowing that Odegaard will deliver it in time for him. And it causes problems because a six foot four striker in full pelt running through on goal is panic for everybody. It's panic for the defenders thinking, have I lost, do I have enough time to make up for it? It's panic for the goalkeeper. Have I given myself enough room to close him down? And the answer today was no, because he went past you, basically, and, and he's got a penalty. Um, I will say, though, overall, there is no doubt in my mind that, considering how much we've been essentially fucked by the rest of the season, on balance, we deserve that penalty. That's my take on it. Uh, Mitch, what do you make of the penalty yourself? Um, I've never liked that kind of penalty, personally. Mm. I, I feel as if... You can't just fucking drag a toe like a fucking wide receiver in college football <laughs> and get a penalty when you probably could have stayed on your foot and slotted the ball anyway, especially if you're running away from goal. Um, mm-hmm. What did you make of it? Like, let's just be honest. It doesn't really bother me one or the other. Like, if anything, I enjoy the fact that if people want to call us cheats, I'm good with that. You know, because it's not 115 charges. Yeah, I, I think uh, my take on this, and I think similarly with the Raya thing later, uh, is the call on the field was hard to overturn. Like both in both instances, David Coop made a decision. Um, and was that the right decision? It was too close to overturn. Um, both of them were like, yeah, uh, that could be a foul on both of those. And, and that's why both of those were not overturned because, um, VAR is not supposed to referee a game. Um, like David Coop making these decisions on the field is what he's supposed to do as a referee. 
and VAR is supposed to see if he made a major mistake. And in both ca- both cases, VAR determined that he did not make a major mistake because mm-hmm. if they looked back and there was no contact, like Kai jumped over him and fell over, I think it probably would have been overturned. But the fact that Kai does keep his leg down and there's contact and that's why he goes over, that's why it's given as a penalty. Um, and at the end of the day, if people want to complain like that we like won this game because of VAR calls or whatever, it, 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 this is why I'm not, I'm never like truly buying into like, oh, there's an agenda against Arsenal for referee decisions because I think the referees are just kind of bad at their jobs. Um, and it kind of just affects teams one way or the other. I think it all, for the most part, evens out throughout a season because we've gotten a lot of 50-50 calls. But we've also had a lot of 50-50 calls that have gone against us in, in tough moments, uh, which is why I've always said, like, you've just got to play better than the refs. You you just need to, like, play to where it's not an issue, which is why Iriola after the game, was like, I don't really agree with those calls, but they were better than us. They deserve to win, which is the correct way to look at this. Like, if we, if we if it was the other direction where, like, we played and com- and created 4XG, um and and we had 50 50 uh calls go against us i think we'd have a right to be really annoyed but the fact that we were just overarchingly the better team i think clears it up a little bit like this Mm. was a demolition this doesn't Mm. need to come down to granular like is this a penalty because by the rule of law it is well said mitch um on one end we saw odegaard essentially create that penalty uh which saka converted and we'll get to that a little later uh and he he created that penalty from the left side, which we've kind of advocated quite a bit on this pod that we'd like him to be there more often, maybe even permanently moving forward. Uh, but from the right side, he he can play that half space cross. And he did mm-hmm. play that cross, which Havertz, again, great center forward play today, mm-hmm. nodded down for Rice, who fucked up on that one chance that Coach already mm-hmm. talked about a little bit. Um, but I only said all that because I fancy myself a really good host because mm-hmm. I want to talk about Declan Rice, the third candidate in my eyes for man of the match. Coach, do you think he stole it with the fact that he got a goal and an assist and just was generally active throughout the entire game like he's been for most of the season? I'm not going to I'm not going to take it away from him. It's it's very pleasing to to know that we're we're struggling to to decipher who are who are men the matches. They actually know it's a great team performance. Um but on Rice, I think he's just uh, he's he's even exceeded my expectations and I want to say five, mate, five years ago, maybe I wasn't high on him at all. And year on year, he's added stuff to his game. So, like, he literally each year he seems to be adding like two more, two or three more things to his game. And this year, the big thing is is his creativity and goal scoring that he's added, considering all the other stuff that he could do. That is quite terrifying. Um, I f- I really just enjoy him in that number eight role and. He just there's there's very much shades of Ramsey there, but I think he's 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 significantly better than him um, defensively, and that's incredibly helpful. Engine wise, I I might give it to Ramsey, but um, yeah, he he he's able to to cover so much ground. It's almost like a cheat code, basically. Um, yeah, it's almost like a cheat code, and he's probably got I want to say another two levels before we can say. There's there's peak Declan Rice, <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm over the moon. I've, I've spoken about him so so much, and yeah, one more thing actually though, he's he's understanding interpretation of space has helped him so much so that he's able to dribble out of dribble out of like some hairy situations now, which I think is again even more terrifying. A six foot three guy that's that powerful, but is able to actually weave his way through midfield now is a little bit a little bit unfair, I'd say. <laughs> In the end, he's going to be A.R. Toure. Um, Mitch, I know you'll kill me if you don't <laughs> have to talk a little bit about Declan Rice. So if you have anything else to add to that, now is your time. I actually don't have much to add about Declan Rice, but I wanted to add in about your Man of the Match candidates because one of the lovely things about winning 3-0 is that there's many players that played very well. And I want to talk about Martin Odegaard for a second. Um, <laughs> because... <laughs> Why? Why can't I talk about Martin Odegaard? You can, but I don't, I don't want to hear it, but go ahead. <laughs> I didn't even go through the Euros, I, bro. I don't give a fuck about this dude no more, man. It's over, he's man. truly one of my favorite players in the world to watch. And mm-hmm. when he is playing the way that he was today, it, it is 
just a fucking joy because mm. I think I think there's a there's a large discussion that is had about uh, our right side like outweighing our left side in terms of mm. just like chances created through that side and stuff like that. But I think it's just so much of it is um, it's just wherever Martin Odegaard is like that is he is the person that's collecting the ball from deep. He's the person mm. that cr- is creating high. He is everywhere across the field throughout the entire game. He's leading our press. He's um, creating chances. He's linking up with players. Like there's times where chances are created from the left and it's oftentimes when he drifts over to the left, but most of the time he spends on the right and him, white Saka have such a good understanding that even have Like if you look at the, the average positions map, Havertz even is drifting over to the right to create this little square um, because people want to be orbiting around Martin Odegaard. That is mm-hmm. where the action is going to be. That is where the ball is at all times. And he is making, he's making soccer happen <laughs> yeah. at all times. Um, and it's, I, I adore watching him. I thought he was fucking wonderful today. I think he would be a candidate for man of the match if uh, the three aforementioned players didn't also have wonderful, wonderful games. Mm-hmm. You know what, to be fair, he's also a candidate, but I was only going to do three. So now at the end of the pod, we're not going to talk about United anymore. Because Mitch wanted to talk about Martin. Okay. <laughs> but the, the end time of the season, if we don't talk about this motherfucker every goddamn week, I'm tired. Tired, bro. Um, this, is, this is blonde privilege. This is blonde, that's what this is. It's blonde privilege. You people just notice be. him so it much because be. he's blonde. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, coach. You were at the stadium once again. I keep telling people your location like some kind of snitch. God damn, this Kendrick shit got in my head. <laughs> oh, oh my God, I'm finished. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there was such a, because of the uh, the VAR check before Saka actually got to take the penalty, it took a while for him to take it. Uh, are we long beyond the point where we fear that he will ever actually miss a penalty again? Um, I don't think you can ever say that really until his career is over. <laughs> but but um, but I I just have every confidence in him, and I think it's I think his pen, penalty technique is really good. You know, it's now so that he can um he can essentially change change his mind at the last second if he needs to, which I'm not a huge fan of. I gen I hate it personally, but at the top level, when you're so good, um, when you're so so good, I think he's I, I think he he's able to do that, but. Me, I like to smash it. You know, I, I pick my, my sport and if the goalkeeper gets there, you know, I feel sorry for your face if it hits it, basically. Um, but yeah, I, you know, there was expectancy in the stadium. You know, nobody was, I don't feel like anybody was actually nervous. You know, I feel like West Ham is well and truly buried now. There's no real, there's no, yeah, there's no real uh, um, issue there. Uh, but I don't know if you remember, going back to the Porto penalties, he mentioned, he mentioned that he practiced the day before that exact spot where you put it. And I feel like pretty much now every um, training session before the match day, he, he must spend, you know, a good few minutes on penalties just because, you know, there's always an opportunity there. And I think he's probably picked that same spot yesterday and he's he's done it in the game today, basically. So. To, to be fair, I don't know if it was a great placement for his penalty. Like it hmm. was kind of like middle low on the he other side. The like goal, he he knew, he, yeah, he knew where the goalkeeper was going. That's what I mean. He probably changed his mind at the last minute. So. And and that's big in terms of just technique in general. It's way more than placement because as a goalkeeper, you're taught to uh, read the the taker's hips. Like yeah. their hips are going to be facing likely where they're going to go. So the ability to change it in the last direction may look like a less pretty finish in terms mm. of like where the ball ends up. It's like, oh, if he went the other way, then it would have been safe. Mm. But Saka intentionally sent him the other way um, is the mark of a good penalty taker. Yeah, so in my in my era of the game, because I, I don't know if this is my era anymore, but in my era of the game, the best penalties. Well, we're all going to say the best penalty is the one that goes in. But growing up, the best penalty was the one that sent the keeper the other way. Yeah. <laughs> like, like when you can get that guy going the wrong way, when you send him for a drink to the shops, that's a that's a good penalty right there. Um, while we're on Bukayo, uh, Mitch. This week he didn't get nominated in the in the final five for the Football Writers Association Player of the Year. Phil Foden ended up winning it. Uh, do you think he was overlooked in a sense here? I, I feel as if we have our shiny new toy in Declan Rice. Uh, mm-hmm. Odegaard has been great in the run-in, but I kind of feel as if the guy that's kind of brought the stats, the guy that we can consistently rely on in a team that's at the top mm-hmm. of the table, is not really getting talked about for individual honors at the end of the season. What do we make of this? Mm. 
it's uh i feel like this is a common thing with great players uh where their greatness becomes so consistent Mm -hmm. that it's boring Mm -hmm. um like saka hit 20 goals in all competitions today and i was like I mean, yeah, it's kind of what I expect from him. Mm. Um, and it's not even like as big of a thing as like it was like last year when he did that for the first time. It's like, yeah, that's that's kind of like the standard now. Like he's he is so consistently good that it's boring. Um, I think Phil Foden, uh, for example, uh, who is a great player, um, I think he's popping on screen more now because he's more of the main man for City than he ever has been. Um, like the time in which De Bruyne was out made it flashier of like oh here's phil foden he has arrived here's like the player that we've seen flashes of is just like a consistently really really good player now Hmm. um doesn't necessarily mean he's better he's been better than saka this season um but i think saka has done it so consistently that uh it's easy to overlook as well as he has a little been a little bit slower lately like Hmm. there hasn't been like as many of like the flashy moments um Hmm. within the last two months and I think recency bias is always going to be kind of a thing when it's such a long season. Like, th- think back to the beginning games of the season. Doesn't, like, Tomiyasu getting sent off against Crystal Palace seem like, like, three years ago? Yeah. Like, that that seems like years ago, and it was earlier this season. Um, So, like, I can't even, like, can't even, like, picture some sack of goals from the beginning of the season. Mm. So sometimes it just comes down to recency bias of, like, hey, Phil Foden scored a hat trick recently. Like, he's been damn good. Um, and, and sometimes you don't even think about just like how good consistently the Kyle Sack mm-hmm. has been. Yeah. yeah I Tommy mean, Yasu sending off was hilarious because he got sent off for not throwing the ball quickly enough. And now we're allowing people to basically be head of the um, coach. Yeah. <laughs> Get back in there on Saka, please. Yeah. No, no, you're, 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 you're right. So yeah, that game was hilarious because, <laughs> yeah, because I was, I felt like I was the only one, only one in the stadium. Yeah. That wanted the game to end in like the 83rd minute while everybody, <laughs> while the entire crowd around was like, was like, you know, they was willing the ref to, to add 10 minutes on added time and shit. Like, it was honestly a nightmare that night. Um, but yeah, look, Saka, look, I'll just be very real. I went through some, I was looking at some old tweets basically of mine. Um, and it's remarkable that people probably forget how rubbish he was on the right, basically. That like people for, people forget that so much so that and I, I know he was really young when he went there, but the disparity disparity in performances between him on the left, right, not left back, but playing on the left of our attack and the right was was night and day, right. He wasn't a good right winger when Arteta first played in there. And now you look at the difference. I know yes, it's development and he's young, but you look at the difference. A lot of people can't picture him playing on the left. They just can't. And as so much of his good work, so much what get got him kept got him and kept in the team came from him playing on the left. Now that he's so indispensable to us from the right hand side, you know that you, you can argue he's better from the right now than he ever was from the left. That's the mark of a great player, the mark of a consistent player, the mark of someone that is consistently improving. Not just his actual overall play, but the numbers are showing that as well. You know, Saka is becoming like a is becoming a playmaker in, in in some phases. He's becoming an off the ball runner. He's becoming someone. He's becoming someone that actually pins defenders now. Like it's he's complete, and that can be boring. It generally can be boring for people because they they can't spot something that they want to say. Oh, but he doesn't really do this. It's like oh no, he does this as well. Oh, and he does this as well. Kind of thing. It's almost like oh well, if we can't really spot anything that he doesn't do. You know, other players do this better than him anyway, kind of thing. But you can argue that they don't. You know, really and truly, I think it, I think there's I think there's one player in the Premier League from that position that I can argue does something better than Saka, and that's Salah, and that's simply scoring goals and he's off and he's off the ball movement. I don't feel as if Saka trails behind him in any sort of other, I suppose, technical department. I mean, I, I firmly believe Saka's probably got a better right foot than him as well. So, yeah, it's it's boring because there's nothing to to say that he can't do, you know, that's why it's boring and that's why it potentially gets overlooked. So that is that is such interesting insight from both of you, but I was just gonna say it's racism, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you motherfuckers talk for a whole four minutes on this little motherfucker and nobody said it's racism. That's crazy to me. Like, you, oh, you go there. 
<laughs> he teed up a two oh, second man. segment and we took five minutes on it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. hey, hey, man, y'all, y'all, I don't blame you guys again. Kendrick keeps popping up like these motherfuckers dropping yeah. six minute diss tracks and shit. I get it. We're getting want... free verses now, Dean. Free no, I verses. don't want free verses. I want to sleep. <laughs> I want, I'm old. I need to make your point and let me move on. I beg. You know, um, at halftime, we probably should have been four or five up, to be honest. Um, yeah. I would say of all the players, because we're still going to have to decide on our official SPS man of the match at the end mm-hmm. of this pod. So keep thinking, guys. Of mm-hmm. all the players at halftime, for me, it was definitely Havertz as man of the mm-hmm. match after the first half. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, we, we, there were 16 shots, five on target, um, mm-hmm. And 2.2 expected goals, but we only had one goal. So it was very inefficient. Um, I don't know if I ever thought like this before we learned about XG, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the second half started. The first memorable moment for me was Rice and Havertz basically combining set sack up for what was a sitter. He hit it very mm-hmm. softly, then going um, Travers and Gormit's uh, goal had a really good game. He conceded three goals, but I thought he had a fantastic mm-hmm. game. Uh, then Bournemouth were much brighter. They actually came out to yeah. play a little bit more. It's not that they didn't want to play in the first half, but we were, we were just better. We didn't let them breathe. Mm-hmm. In the second half, they got into the game. Cl- Clivert had a free kick uh, that was generated by a foul by Gabriel on Sholanke. Mm-hmm. Uh, Semenya was running pretty well. Clivert had mm-hmm. another shot that went just wide. You know, So they were looking pretty good. Then... Oh, oh, oh. I wanted to mention one more Sholanke shot. The one at Raya that Raya saved, um, because mm. one of the big criticisms of what our uh, Golden Glove winning goalkeeper people, mm. yeah, I don't care that he doesn't make saves. He made a save there. That's mm-hmm. the way we've designed our team to play. You know what? I'm gonna let Coach talk about this because you like those yeah. nerdy tactics shit. But there's an argument I believe that the reason why Raya doesn't really have a lot to do is because that's the way our team is designed. You know, mm-hmm. more often than not a shot for the other team is actually their crossing because they can't mm-hmm. get to the middle. Yeah. So we frustrate them to the point that they try to go in through the side, and when they do that, that's where Raya shots. Yeah. What do you think of my little theory? No, that's, I, think, I think that's what I think. The further, as a defending team, any team in the world, the further you, you keep your defender, away, your, your, your um, opposing team away from your goal, the better you're, you're doing a good job. You're, you're, def- you're in, in a sense, you're, you are defending. That's what you're supposed to do. So when you force them wide and then they cross into the box now, that's now that's a percentage ball. Unless you're crossing to prime Alan Shearer and it's David Beckham crossing it, that's not the way most teams want to generate all of their chances. But it seems against Arsenal, sometimes we, sometimes obviously we get beaten through the middle, but more often than not, it's through wide positions, right? And that's okay because yes, the ball has to travel through God knows how many defenders before he gets to the target. Um, but Ray is really, really, really fucking good at claiming crosses. That like freakishly, that like freakishly good. And I think our team, especially when, especially the way we, the, the way we squeeze kind of thing, it's almost like uh, an automism defensively now, where Ray primes himself for the cross because he knows, do you know what? We frustrated them enough now. Now it's my time to get the ball. And set us on set us on an attack. And sometimes, you know, you can be caught by that. You know, obviously Modric, obviously, because he's extra aggressive. But overall, I think it, like you said, it, it genuinely is by design. You know, we've got two six foot defenders. One of them is a monster in the air, and the other one's getting better and better pretty much every game in the air as well. He's, again, he's, he's still really young, so it's going to get to a point now where teams we're probably going to have to accept that Raya might eat a few more Galenos you know, in his Arsenal time, because that's where, that's where it's going to, basically. Um, Mitch, who do you think has bigger hands, Kendrick or Drake? Uh, no, that's not what I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty don't cool. ask me about the rap beef. I don't fucking know. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to give you some credit here, bro. That, yeah, that's all, you know, like, you, that could have been your moment to shine. You know, pretend you were black for all of one minute. But if you don't want, yeah, dude, I, I scammed my way into this podcast. I don't know shit about that. <laughs> um, I put that um that really good spell of play for Bournemouth because it I felt like it was kind of confined to a five minute spell of the game. Uh, Rice robbed someone in their midfield, someone that had probably kicked an Arsenal player fifteen times, and I got carded for it. But I don't know who it was. Rice robbed someone of the ball, ran up the field. 
Actually, no, that's not what happened. I think the play mm. went through the right. But Mitch, you might have a better memory than me because you don't mm. do the drugs I do, so go ahead. Um, I All I remember is really the, like, Rice getting Threw the ball, away. like, out from under him and back healing it to Trussard, who one, one touch finished it. Um, and it's just awesome having someone who's just, like, a fucking killer like Trussard mm. is. Um, like... I I think one of the one of the things from like the Liverpool teams over the last like four or five years that's like I've been like a little jealous of is someone like Diego Jota mm. who's just gonna like show up and score a goal mm. and that is like exactly what Trussard has been for Arsenal. I mean, obviously, right now in this in this run of games, he's starting and I think he will be for the last two two games of the season. But like at the, at the end of the day, he's been like a utility player for the most part since we've gotten him, and he's just been someone who's just. He's going to put the ball in the back of the net. He's probably the best finisher at the club. Um, and it's it's really nice to have someone like that in a pressure moment where Bournemouth are going back into the game. We we'll only have a 1-0 advantage. We've got to put this away. And he's just going to hit it one time and it's going to go in. Um, and it, it's it's awesome to have a player like that who who didn't even like have that impactful of a game. Like Didn't have all that many touches of the ball. Granted, uh, we mentioned earlier, left side doesn't get as much attention. Uh, but he takes his opportunity, he puts it in the back of the net, we're cruising. Yeah. yeah. I was like, Coach, I feel like you, you really want to get in on this Trussard thing, so go ahead. No, I, I, to be honest, to be honest, no, Mitch has, Mitch has covered it mostly, but I will say that finish was very, very Arshavin like against Barcelona, you know, and I've compared Trussard to Arshavin God knows how many times at this point, <laughs> and it's, this is just helping my claim even more. Um, yeah, to follow up, like, no, great finish, and Rice again, space invading, man, he, he's the best. Look, Rice is the best player in the world, guys. I'm sorry, he just is. I really love Declan Rice. <laughs> Better than Rodri, baby. Better than Rodri. We're here now. We're here to talk that shit. You know, like we're leaving with something. If, if we don't win this Premier League, we're going with the best DM in the world right now. But yeah, yeah. Uh, shit, man. We already Mitch already kind of made the point about the the VAR discussion on the Bournemouth goal. Uh, we can mm. talk about that a little bit more. But honestly, for me, people might say, "Oh, I've heard a lot of chatter about," uh, or "I saw a lot of chatter online about." Oh, well, Ben, ben White does more than Sholanke did to Raya there. And I'm just like, listen, man, you guys can have it both ways. If you want them to call it, then they called it today. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, if, and if it's not a problem, then what are we bitching about? I mean, like, yeah. for me, it wasn't that it was a big enough shove to fuck Raya up or anything like that, but mm-hmm. he did have an impact on what Raya was going to do there. Mm-hmm. If he didn't mm-hmm. make the movement that he made, Raya goes up and catches it direct. Yeah. Because he did what he did, Raya had to go around him and punch the ball. Yeah. And the ball went in after that. So I'm, you know, David Coots is a coot, but it's cool. When also, he like Ben White, when he's like in the way of a goalkeeper on a corner, is just standing there. He is mm. just kind of being a nuisance by being in the space. Uh, Solanke sh- like puts a push on on Raya um, and makes no effort to go for the ball. And then, like I also said earlier, it was called on the field as a foul, so it was really hard to overturn. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand people's fr- frustration with that one way more than I do with the Havertz penalty, uh, but I, you know, I'll take it. It all evens out. And yeah. goalkeepers are a protected species, okay? Like, 100%. Yeah, let's, let's not forget that in, in, our, in our fervor to shit on Arsenal, because that's what everyone wants to do. I mean, like, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm an Arsenal fan, but it just kind of feels like it's a little different. It's, it's always felt that way, <laughs> but, you know, I don't want to sound like mm-hmm. a Liverpool fan, so let's move on. Um, <laughs> my next thing for Trossard and... Uh, Pretty quickly afterwards, he had another one of those breaks that he's had in the past couple of games, and he just kind of fell over. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, look, man, we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pack our loads. Uh, we'll, we'll go away. We'll go away for the summer, Martin. Then he, we'll go and we'll get in the lab and, and we'll come back. You know, I, I thought he was back. He was wearing the the wrist, the hand and wrist um wrap. I thought, you know what? Yeah, my boy is back. You know, and no. He's he's not back. I think we can just we can charge it now. We can accept that he might do something for us in the last two games, but we've got to file this season as a as a de- development season. Just accept it for it. It's a it's a development season, and there's nothing wrong with that. He's twenty three. He's twenty two years old. Sorry. So yeah, it's normal. Um, I just don't like the chatter of oh he's the one that we're going to sacrifice to get this new superstar forward, and rather than um um you know accepting that oh no this is a re- this is a superstar already. He's just having a developmental season. At 22 years old, it's it's there's no it's a no brainer for me. Um, I I personally want him back in the first eleven next season. If all things being equal, I I can't, you know, I I just think he's 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 that good. But um, yeah, that that actual chance itself it reeked of complete and utter 
rock bottom confidence. He just he didn't look convincing. And even the, the way he ran through on goal, I know it was dis- disallowed, but he had a very similar chance against United last season. And I knew he was scoring every time. And he did. Obviously, it was disallowed. Got disallowed. It was, it was, it was. It, but I'm saying, but look, but look at the difference in and the assertiveness in, in the way he ran through on goal and the way he looked like he was scoring from the moment he took his first touch. Today, I just, I was sitting down, like I wasn't up thinking, oh yeah, such, no, I just like I can accept this one is not going in. And the way he fell down, it was just, yeah, it, it compounded everything. I was just like, yeah, it is. Well, May I tell you, bro? He, he fell face first like a little idiot. Like, yeah, like, it was, it was, it was, quite, it, was it was embarrassing, honestly. <laughs> Uh, those Chinese panda zoo videos and yeah, Mitch, the best goal of the game got disallowed. Mm. How hurt are you that that Gabriel goal didn't count? That's just gonna live in one of those you know spiritual beautiful goals that didn't get to stand. Uh, Trossards from last season, I forget mm. who was against, but he scored like an absolute banger. And then- oh, Lester. Because yeah, and then and White was, was a yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that one and um, oh, Martinelli's against Man United last year. Mm-hmm. The, the, those are just gonna live in in a beautiful place where the rules of life are fair, where mm-hmm. great goals can stand because they're cool. Yeah. And and we we need to unite against this tyranny of Englishness <laughs> of of not allowing whoa, whoa. cool goals to stand because whoa, 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 of marginal <laughs> it's not an, let's 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 not let's not let's not get go there. It's not an English ring. It's not an English ring, right? Yes it is. <laughs> okay, maybe it is. Okay. Okay, I accept it. You My motherfuckers don't <laughs> it, it rains there all the time. You literally started this podcast rejoicing at the fact that you could wear shorts. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Sad motherfuckers, man. <laughs> Sad, like, y'all used to be an empire. Look at you now, you motherfuckers are shit, shit. No, we, we suck, man. That, <laughs> we man. Suck. That. Like, it, like England sucks so bad that when they tried to make Idris Elba James Bond, I was like, nah, we don't need that right now. I'm like, that's no. cool. like, you know, you know. I was never on that train, honestly. Nah, that. <laughs> uh, but man, what a fucking hit! Like, yeah, that that would have been some goal, some goal. Yeah, but. On the bright side, it means that um, I don't know which one of him or Saliba has scored more goals this season. Um, it's guessing. Gabriel. It's Gabriel. It's still Gabriel, mm-hmm. but at least it's still mm-hmm. close. So Saliba can maybe catch him because we can tell from his chance earlier in this game that mm-hmm. he's still trying. He's still trying. I know they have yeah. a yeah. one, so we'll see who wins that at the end of the season. United, mm-hmm. watch out. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say, <laughs> it. I didn't say it out loud. Um, then I suppose the final, final really interesting happening in the game was in the seventh minute of extra time. I don't understand why we had mm. so much injury time in this game. I'm trying to think of what the reasons for that could have been, and I really can't. VAR remember. check, goal, yeah. like yeah, the, there was the, there was a fair amount. Yeah. Okay, on the okay, fair enough, fair enough. Two goals and a VAR check, but still seven minutes is a lot. There weren't that many subs, mm. at least not for Arsenal. It was just uh, Gabi Jesus came on at some point for Saka, and he got a standing yeah. ovation or whatever. But yeah, seven minutes felt like a lot. But in any event, it allowed us to score our third goal, and that's where. <clears throat> Rice drops on in midfield, pass it forward, and just ran past three Bournemouth players, got it back from Gabi Jesus, who had mm-hmm. carried it and done some jinking for a little bit, and just blasted past the goalkeeper. Um, mm-hmm. We've already venerated this dude, so I don't really know what else to say. I just, watching from home, I remember thinking that, damn, this kind of reminds me of September when I was at the United game with Coach, and Declan Rice scored mm-hmm. a late third goal for Arsenal in that game. Yeah. And, you know, we got to yeah. the No, right he scored the second. Game. What's that yeah, he scored the second in that game. He scored he the scored winner. Oh, shit, United. Second. Yeah, 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 yeah. He scored yeah. all those late goals after. You know what? Let me not sound like Ten Hag. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in any event, uh, I'm going to go back to the question that's been bugging me the whole podcast because uh, there's not mm. much to say about that goal. It was great. We all saw it. It was lovely. Mm. Who was your man of the match? I want you to rank them from one to three. Then we will pick one together. Mitch, you go. First. Do you want to go first, Mitch? Uh, shit. Uh, I'm gonna go. Uh, Rice one. Pause. Uh, pause, Havertz. pause. 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 Start over. But you can include Odegaard now since you ruined it earlier. I was going to include Odegaard. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rice one, Havertz two, Odegaard three, Saliba four. Mm. Wow, wow. That's almost the inverse of me because I'm going Saliba one. Um. I'm going to Libra one, uh, Rice two. No, I'm going Havertz two, uh, Rice three. Yeah, 
Odegaard would be fourth, but yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bother. He's had enough men in the matches. Of, you know, he'll be he'll be alright. <laughs> um, using my my power as host of the chat, hmm. whatever this, whatever is. the fuck that is. Yeah. <laughs> is it just a vape? Like, are you I, using I, a vape as not, like? <laughs> hey, see, see, this is why we don't allow white people on the pod. Look at you, snitch. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go with Saliba as my man of the match as well. Yeah. The only mm. justification besides him being an excellent footballer is that he's the only black person we talked about in that. So, yeah. There you go. Our man of the match, yeah. William Saliba. Um, guys, the next yeah. one is a big one at Old Trafford. I've already expressed mm-hmm. some trepidation about it. Um, I'm sure you guys could hear my voice trembling when I talked about it. We'll let the person who probably has the most confidence about this fixture sort of. Tell us what you expect when we go there next week, Mitch. Um, I I feel more comfortable going to Old Trafford than I ever have, and it's mm. mostly because we are better than ever, and they are worse than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, th- this is this is not a good Manchester United team. This is not a healthy Manchester United team. Uh, inversely, we left healthy people off the bench today. Like Timber didn't make the bench despite allegedly being healthy. Mm-hmm. So like, it, we were in really really good shape. We're in great form. I think we I think we win our last two games and we've mm. just got to rely on on city dropping points somewhere. Mm. Um but like oh, oh, I think it'll be it's it's always scary playing against United because they are good at dictating the like counterattack and it being kind of end to end. Um it's not control by any means, but they are good at uh having end to end happen. And there will be parts of the game that are nervy and we need to make sure that we can ride the waves. Mm. Um like they will get their chances. We need to make sure that those don't go in the back of the net. It's simple as if we if we if we strike first, I think we win easily. Yeah. Um, if if we don't go into halftime uh, with a like a deficit where Man United has that old Trafford going in with a lead juju, uh, like I, I don't want to deal with that. So um, if we strike first, I think we win. Well said, yeah. Coach. Um, I'll give you the last word today. Uh, this whole transitional bullshit that United have been. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't even say living on because they've been mostly dying on it, you know, by, their, mm-hmm. by, by the standards of that club. How much of that do you think is a result of the fact that, as Jim Ratcliffe said in an email to his staff earlier this week, mm-hmm. that that whole fucking building and stadium is dirty as fuck? Like, are these dirty <laughs> motherfuckers just giving people diseases? Like, what's going on with these United motherfuckers, man? Like, why, why are these motherfuckers living like this, man? It smells like ass at Old Trafford, man. Carrington is a fucking it's, it's called the toilet. It's called a toilet for a reason, bro. Literally, old, to- old toilet. No, old toilet, the toilet. It's been called that for a lot I'm of my United fans called it that. They've been calling it that for years. I've um, learned something new today. That's crazy. I haven't learned in like three years. Thanks. Bro. <laughs> Look, I think I think the whole transition thing again. It's when a new coach comes in, he's gonna unless he wants to play that way, he's gonna scrap all of that. He's gonna scrap all of that because it's just it's not the way you play if you want to compete in England right now. Um, the you know the styles of Arsenal, City, Liverpool they have some they all have some sorts of overlaps. United have zero overlaps with any of the top teams in this country right now. That's the that is part of their problem. There's no overlap to what we do at all. There isn't a single thing I can say. You know, Arsenal do something similar to to United or United do something. No, there isn't. They just is that a ba- is that a bad thing though? Does everyone have to play the same way? No, they don't. It's not about playing the same. There's just certain things. There's certain so for example. Having a certain amount of players behind the ball where you don't have the ball, all three of those teams do. United don't because they leave players up because they want to count it. You know, it's just little shit like that. You know, it doesn't make you know it doesn't make sense to me. Everybody can hurt you. United teams that think for some reason that we're still United. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose for us, controlling controlling the counters is going to be huge. Um, I'll tell you, I mentioned something really interesting. And it's not interesting in the sense that, oh, nobody ever thought of it, but it's just interesting that he's actually sounded it out. Um, but he talked about, um, this was on Friday, I believe, he talked about how many changes we've made on the left-hand side. And he accepted, you know, he, it was very much an acceptance that, look, we haven't been as fluid on that side as, as we want to be. And that tells me a couple of things. It tells me that he clearly is aware. It's not something that he just neglected. But also tells me that it's something that he's, clearly working on because of how much um we've now settled there he's become he's he's found something that works there on that left hand side you know Gabriel's always going to be there but Tomiyasu is there now and 
he's a much similar player to Kirior than Zinchenko is. So it's clear that he was probably trialing something. They're seeing, okay, if I can make it work with Kirior, I can definitely make it work with Tomiyasu. So we have that there. Then Declan Rice, again, you know, he's not a similar player to Havertz in a sense that, you know, they're just not similar footballers. But in terms of the ground that they cover, absolutely. They're both space invaders. Again, they both eat up the ground. And then we have the actual left forward. You know, we've tried different combinations with Martinelli, with, with Trossard, Gabby Jesus kind of thing. And I feel like Trossard is the balance in between those players. Fantastic finisher, like Martinelli, but also extremely good in the ball, like Gabby Jesus. He clearly found the formula there in terms of at least the, pro sub, the profiles for that left-hand side of the pitch. And I think that left-hand side of the pitch for us is going to be key against United um, because of who is going going to be playing right back there <laughs> you know so yeah that that's what that's where i'm at a bit for 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 us very well said coach i enjoyed the preview and i hope everyone else did um gabby we're sorry that uh kai Havertz did not win the sps man of the match maybe he should work on being blacker uh but that's yeah. a different discussion for another episode <laughs> in any event guys thanks for coming on thanks for all the insight um we're getting close to to the end times, if you will, and um, hopefully mm. we can get lucky. Yeah. Guys, you know what to tell the people. Peace. Peace. Take a shot. Take a shot.